in societies where modern conditions of production prevail, all of life presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has moved away into a representation. And, and, and that, that, is, that is great. Hi, my name is Peter Coffin. I want to tell you a story, a story about how there's more representation in society than ever before. Now, you might have heard that representation is important. Representation matters. But what is... I'm supposed to stop that. Good. But what is representation? Well... The people who do that stupid clapping thing would probably tell you that representation is how the media presents gender, age, ethnicity, identity, social issues, and events to an audience. They'll tell you that's when someone from a group, any group, is placed in a visible position that people perceive as important and powerful. They would likely say that representation is significant because the media has the power to shape an audience's knowledge and understanding about these topics. And they're not wrong. Like, none of that is false. In fact, it, it makes perfect sense why people would be conscientious about it, even getting hung up about it. Who doesn't love talking about movies, video games, or other art and media that they like? And isn't this stuff all about the fans? Like, don't they say that at every single convention? And if that's true, maybe this is one thing everyday people could have some impact on. So why not attempt to use it as an avenue to pursue justice in an unjust world? But is it really changing anything when a few groups of people furiously argue with each other every time art is or isn't diverse? If it was, we surely would be living in a post-racial utopia by now, because there certainly have been a lot of fandom wars between the woke and the anti-woke. These fandom wars seem pretty endless, though. There's always another piece of media, and there's always another political interpretation of it to feel outraged by. But isn't that kind of <laughs> bullshit? I'm sorry, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, um, how the media portrays things does have an effect on how people perceive them. Duh. And deconstructing the methods the media uses to represent normal people could be a bridge to understanding who has the real power. The issue is that's not really what people do. Instead, obsessed people get mad about big tits and cartoons, and then other obsessed people get mad back, angrily defending artistic renderings of heavy hangers commodified for their enjoyment, and then everyone looks like an idiot because none of it matters. Here's the big question, though. Can good representation actually undo injustice? Or... Is it a way for the dominant power to incorporate various images and aesthetics in a way that it maintains control and minimizes liabilities? Does representation create progress or just the appearance of facilitating progress despite simply preserving the existing relationships between those who own and those who don't? And just to be clear, I think that it's a way for the dominant power to incorporate various images and aesthetics in a way that it maintains control and minimizes liabilities while appearing to facilitate progress despite simply preserving the existing relationships between those who own and those who don't. Even in today's supposedly connected world, learning about people outside of our own social circles and reach can prove to be difficult. Ultimately, media is the way that almost everyone in the United States is exposed to people of different cultures, ethnicities, genders, sexualities, and bowel temperaments. No, seriously, have you ever heard of the Irritable Bowel Syndrome Warriors? Yeah, April is Irritable Bowel Syndrome Awareness Month. Uh, the IBS warriors actually do the identity politics, like, marketing thing for defective shitting. Like, I did not make this shirt. 
I bought this shirt. Anyways, the legitimate, actual problem people seek to correct with representation is that often the way people from marginalized groups are presented in our media is through stereotypes and caricature. There have been many magazine cartoons depicting missionaries or hunters sitting in a huge iron pot, which is surrounded by fierce natives with spears and hungry expressions. First, a few obvious examples that we should immediately confront is that, in the past, the media has represented black people as violent and stupid. Women be shopping, too. Gay people wear bowling and or Hawaiian shirts and are only really capable of offering fashion and interior design advice. Trans women have big old lies tucked away. Before we move on, let's talk about what's really wrong with Ace Ventura. This tuck. That is not how that works. Are we sure this is not just a woman who has shit herself? Because it doesn't go there. Granted, it's a very penis-shaped turd. I'll give them that. Anyways, trans women have big old lies tucked away, blah, blah, blah. And none of them are ever the boss, except for that lion-ass trans woman in Ace Ventura. Let's just see who's lying, shall we? Way uncool 1990s media. Hashtag do better. So if that's the problem, then if the media would just portray these groups as competent and in charge, if they would just portray black people as the boss, women as the boss, and LGBTQ people as the boss, but not lying about anything, they could fix things, right? That's hashtag do bettering, right? Well, wrong, unfortunately. The material conditions of society don't change when the people living in it are simply shown an image which contradicts them. Did you know that, according to research from Feed America, one out of every four black kids in the United States experiences what liberals call food insecurity or what normal people call going hungry? Depicting a black child eating dinner does not change this. Did you know that a little over 1 in 10 women surveyed by the Worker Institute at Cornell University reported quid pro quo harassment at work? That's when a job benefit for an employee is directly tied to an unwelcome sexual advance by a boss or supervisor. Depicting a woman in a position of authority does not change this. Did you know that transgender people, depending on various factors, are between two and three and a half times more likely to live in extreme poverty, that is, making less than $10,000 a year as a non-dependent adult? Depicting a trans person living in a mansion does not change this. I'll probably keep it forever, never wear it again. It was so important. It was my first public appearance, and the dress was <laughs> Donatella Versace. Thank you. So obviously, these are hyperbolic examples. And it's unquestionably good when more black people, women, and trans folks get treated with basic human respect. I'm not here to tell you that's bad. There is a contradiction, though, in representation as a prescription for justice. Uh, the vast majority of people, one, don't actively seek out ethnic, sexual, and gender minorities to simply be mean to them, and two, they don't have the power or ability to meaningfully change the material conditions as described earlier for these groups of people. Basic human respect just isn't the problem here. The power inequity built into class society, which specifically affects these minority groups to a harsher extent, is the problem. The everyday majority can't pay one other person's rent, much less everyone else's rent, or for their groceries, bills, health care, whatever. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I can barely pay my finance charges. Somebody help me. It's not possible, it never has been, and it's never going to be. So it's not power that we hold over these groups. The decisions the vast majority of people make do not affect these groups in the way the decisions a landlord, business owner, or government official could. And indeed, an increasing number of those positions include people from traditionally marginalized groups, breaking the glass ceiling. 
does a queer, black, non-binary person making six figures change things for everyone? No. The problem is that those positions exist to be filled. The problem is not who fills them. Yet we, the everyday majority, are supposed to see good representation and be persuaded to, I guess, not be meanies. We're the ones who are supposed to see these positive depictions and change our minds so that we hashtag do better. We're the ones who are supposed to read Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility and Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, then check our privilege, hold space for BIPOC, and shut the fuck up. Never mind that the everyday majority has a lot of BIPOC in it. BIPOC with inconvenient viewpoints for the abolish the police crowd, for instance. You're supposed to listen to BIPOC until BIPOC agree with the everyday majority, which is, by the way, the everyday majority of BIPOC. The rhetoric in these books, and indeed all of the representation as a conduit for change rhetoric I'm addressing today, is about what you and I can do to change our interpersonal behavior and not about the fact the class of people Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are part of hold an insanely large portion of the world's wealth and have unaccountable ownership of the infrastructure. They can give and they can take, and you can't say shit. The idea that bigotry as a whole is dependent on what everyday people simply think serves to reduce the liability of those with capital and obscure the inequality that the state's upholding of class society creates. Let's talk about climate change for a minute. Study after study shows that the majority of the population of the United States believes that climate change is real. So, I think, we need to characterize the issue as well-represented. Indeed, many take it so seriously they've moved to electric vehicles, stopped eating meat, started growing food or buying local, or whatever. Things that can be characterized as major rearrangements to their lifestyles. Yet, the problem doesn't seem to be getting any better. The average global temperature continues to rise, and it tracks alongside data showing rises in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Is the problem that the unwashed masses won't change their minds and therefore their habits? Or is it something else? A statistic that gets thrown around a lot is that just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of the world's emissions. Sometimes people cite this statistic and claim that we just need to abolish those companies and that's that, but it's actually a lot more complex. The supply chains behind this statistic would not simply disappear, nor would we want them to. People depend on them for various reasons, food, energy, machines, etc. The issue is that control over the apparatus that results in 71% of the world's emissions is in the hands of just 100 companies. Because of this, the decisions that result in these emissions are made by unaccountable, privately held entities made up of comparatively few people. It's the decision of energy companies how to generate electricity. It's the decision of a car company if they're going to continue to make cars that emit exhaust. It's the decision of both state and private entities alike not to have public transportation. Meaning, it's not our decision. Yet, according to Harvard research, companies like ExxonMobil run mass influence campaigns that range from peer-reviewed research to advertorials that's sponsored content presented as an editorial running in the New York Times intended specifically to get consumers to believe that energy demand is ultimately the reason ExxonMobil does what it does, and that the company supports people's efforts to reduce their demand. And yes, people can just pay the New York Times or anyone else to run content that looks like an article, but it's an advertisement. No, it's not illegal. And no, it's not just ExxonMobil that does it. Anyways, did you know that the term carbon footprint is from a BP campaign? 
Yeah, it didn't come from climate activists at all, although climate nonprofits were really quick to adopt the terminology and not generating profits means you're always right, <laughs> right? BP marketed the term carbon footprint to make you feel like climate change is your fault, despite the fact that the majority of your quote unquote carbon footprint is emitted without your consent. So it's not really your carbon footprint, is it? So, um, what's your carbon footprint? You using the LED light bulbs in your house? Or are you a huge asshole? Why isn't your roof covered in solar panels, you disgusting pig? Where's your battery, sicko? Are you tracking your energy usage in the app? Are you tracking your energy usage in the app? Have you built up your racial stamina yet? Racial stamina is a term that was knocked together by the author of White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo. In short, racial stamina is the capacity to endure racial stress when presented with the fact that many white people are complicit in systemic racism. Hi, I'm Robin D'Angelo. I am a cisgender white woman of working class origin from San Jose, California. My area of expertise consists in capitalizing on an important societal need, teaching white people to appear to condemn racism. Racial stamina is the ability to sit in the discomfort, anxiety, and guilt that arise when realizing that we are part of communities and institutions that perpetuate racist assumptions and patterns. Since white people in North America are the dominant racial group, we seldom experience racial discomfort and thus haven't had the opportunity to develop racial stamina. You see, you get a buff of plus one racial stamina by equipping white fragility, and there's a side quest where you attend a Robin D'Angelo seminar that can get you over that first level requirement. So my character is actually pretty high on racial stamina, but I unfortunately uh, didn't put any points into the gag reflexibility, which is an important stat to get through anything involving this book. Are you tired of racism? Are you aware that you are unaware of the ways you're harming traditionally marginalized groups with your every move? Do you hate how inherently fragile white people are. Do you need to build a little racial stamina? Well, I've written the only book you'll ever need, White Fragility. This book will help you, a white, face your failures. Failures that I alone, the great Robin D'Angelo, can point out to you because other people might tell you it's not actually you. It is! You're bad! You were born bad! And you need to atone. When you finally do understand those failures, you'll also understand that subconsciously you fail in other ways. And you'll understand that you must understand those failures. Confess! After you've become a very progressive white person, you can get my next only book you'll ever need, Nice Racism, How Progressive White People Perpetuate Racial Harm. After you understand those failures you, a progressive white, subconsciously further fail at, you can understand that there are more failures we can address at my seminars and workshops that you can attend for just $200. I'm the fucking Tony Robbins of anti-racism. I can't fix racism, but I can say stuff that makes you think I can, and that makes you a repeat customer. You are broken! You will always be broken! My books and seminars will help you act less broken. The more you pay me, 
the less broken you will seem. That's racial stamina. My speaking fee is between thirty and forty thousand dollars for two hours, and I charge three hundred and twenty dollars per hour for phone calls. This mode of fighting bigotry is more aspirational self-help crap than it is about addressing why one group has more than another. And just like how generalized self-help turns out not to be the tools to enable individuals to survive and thrive, rather an industry seeking to nurture dependence and find repeat customers, deference to image turns into a kind of lifestyle marketing. Try the anti-racism diet right next to the vegan food section in your local grocery. The central belief is, just like with self-help, almost religious. We are intended to improve our relationship with a generalized figure of worship, a fetishized version of a traditionally marginalized group that is good, pure, and, well, basically a modern version of the noble savage trope. For quick reference, a noble savage is an overused and reductive concept of a person from outside civilization who hasn't been quote-unquote corrupted by society or some section of it. And therefore, this person symbolizes humanity's innate goodness. Generally, a noble savage trope is employed to glorify natural life. Noble savages can be found in fictional works and non-fictional historical accounts and are essentially a fantastical creation of people who feel that modern society is bad or tainted, usually without a material basis for it. And that isn't to say there isn't something truly alienating about class society. The feeling a person has of being separated from their sense of self, their time and effort and their choices and other people becomes itself relatable. And that which is relatable is consumable repackaging a prominent symptom of the capitalist dystopia Marx laid bare. But this form of observation, again, basically a modern version of the noble savage trope, isn't derived from tangible aspects of class society. Taken in even the best faith, good representation is just advertising aiming at improving the majority group's view of a minority group, which, might I add, has a good intention at the core. The dynamics of a society where markets rule everything distort that intention, though, and, as I said, ultimately turn it into a marketing exercise. When the goal is to improve the public's view of something, the incentive to portray that thing as exclusively positive seems obvious. It's a branding campaign. The staple icon is simply representing who we are. It represents so much of who we are and who we will be to our customers. We hope you love it too. There is necessity to be reductive in advertising, for brevity's sake as much as for persuasion. So there really is no reason to present negative images regarding the subject of a positive branding campaign. In my observation, this trends towards essentialism pretty fast. Ain't nothing like a woman with some nice full lips. Talking in the berry, that's that melanin. Roll your blood running through my veins. So don't you forget I was made this way. Propaganda that justified slavery in Jim Crow basically totaled in black people bad. But in attempting to correct this by simply going in the opposite direction. What are the stereotypes of the 1%? Entitled. Selfish. Me, me, me. White. To market black people as good has unintended results. Sheila Johnson became one of the highest net worth black women in the United States with the help of a game-changing television network, BET. She helped build BET from two hours of programming a week to a major network worth $2.3 billion by the time it was sold to Viacom in 2001. So you are one of the, I would imagine, few black women to own a property like this. Probably. You know, I don't know. You know. I'm proud. Yeah. I'm very proud. Is this more fun than BET? Oh, yes. <laughs> Namely, that it creates new standards and expectations for good which don't match reality. For example, media representation of George Floyd was regarded precariously, with people tiptoeing around the subject to represent Floyd well, particularly during the trial of Derek Chauvin the officer who killed Floyd by kneeling on his neck for 9 minutes and 31 seconds, according to prosecutors referring to time-stamped body cam footage. Here's the thing. George Floyd was a normal person. 
He was poor and he dealt with opioid addiction, conditions that describe a very, very large segment of the U.S. population. In Minnesota, the state where Floyd was killed, opioids are the leading cause of overdose death for white people, black people, and the indigenous population. A little less than one in three people who are prescribed opioids for chronic pain overuse them, and about one in 10 get addicted to them. George Floyd faced issues that many people far beyond the ideological borders of race deal with. And yet, there was an attempt to push this narrative that he was no angel. To me, this seems like a reaction to the propensity to portray people in similar positions to Floyd and with a similar identity as angels. A reaction to 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 a reaction. I don't think it was a personal failing for him to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. And that's making an assumption without any evidence that it was intentional on his part. Something that, at this point, we just can't know. The 19-year-old cashier that flagged the bill testified that he regrets flagging the bill and felt guilt that Floyd's death was his fault and that it could have been avoided. Now, how the cashier feels, or how I feel for that matter, unfortunately, doesn't change the fact that passing a counterfeit $20 bill is a crime and therefore the ideological justification for George Floyd's death in the eyes of a system where justice is contingent on the preservation of the ruling class's ownership of capital. Class society puts people into positions where passing counterfeit money is necessary. Yes, there are many points where people's choices could have stopped escalating this situation. Yes, the cashier could have not flagged the bill. Yes, Officer Derek Chauvin could have not, you know, fucking murdered the guy. But those choices were informed by hegemonic ideology, the ideology that society is pushed to accept, whether genuinely or cynically. The cashier was told he had to report these kinds of incidents for the business to function correctly, while Chauvin was trained a certain way when he was becoming a police officer, a way in which the general public is an obstacle or enemy, and, whether explicitly or not, that the police serve the purpose of maintaining the antagonisms between people in the owning and working classes. By the ideology these people were inculcated into, they did the right things. Further, by the ideologies that sustain the mechanics of class society and therefore capitalism, Floyd did the wrong thing, assuming he even knew the money was counterfeit, which again, the possibility exists that he did not. But come on, man. We all know George Floyd shouldn't have been killed. Like, only a total asshole, a real piece of shit, would think, ah, this guy sure did deserve to die. However, what we're talking about now is moral stances. The material condition that could have been changed, which would have stopped the situation from happening altogether, is embedded in class society. Financial precarity, poverty, is the condition which prompted the existence of counterfeit currency in the first place. However, because the he was no angel narrative had to be resisted, this kind of analysis isn't engaged in, which doesn't just obscure the conditions which led to the murder of George Floyd, but resentments grow as a totally normal person is portrayed as a saint. Over time, the societal narrative has gone from black people are essentially bad to black people are essentially good, which sounds good until the societal narrative inevitably reverts back to black people are essentially bad because no group of people will ever exclusively be good, thus providing evidence contrary to the narrative, and apparently all a narrative needs to totally shift is a big voice changing their mind, see J.K. Rowling. Also, what does good even mean? Who gets to decide that? A mainstream representation is one created and circulated by those who have the resources to do so, and with no requirement for input by those without the resources to do so. Which, by the way, is the vast majority of people from any and all groups. The fundamental class distinction of owners and everyone else, bourgeoisie and proletariat, should be hard to miss here. The assumptions and worldview of the haves are imprinted upon what they create for the have-nots to consume. 
Mainstream representation, therefore, must serve the agenda of the powerful on at least some level, even if not intentionally. While capital might allow some rabble a place at the table when it's apparent a concession is necessary to avoid some form of uprising, the idea that those in power would consistently work to empower the rabble is totally absurd. And to be clear, the rabble includes anyone who doesn't conform to the representations presented of their group. Benefits, tuition, and flexible hours. They're hiring everywhere, so check it out for yourself. It's my belief that, because of how power works in a class society such as capitalism, mainstream representation can't earnestly change society, instead appropriating subversive images to reinforce the current order. Guy Debord's conceptualization of representation within modern societal conditions is essentially the key to understanding his most consequential work, Society of the Spectacle. Also, he was French, and I am not, so don't ask me to pronounce his name correctly. I know that it's a trap. Debord's work builds on Karl Marx's concept of the commodity and ideology, with Debord's primary observation being that images mediate the social relations among people. What Debord called the spectacle wasn't those images themselves, but the social relation created by having the images act as the conduit for our social interaction. Debord's idea of a spectacular society is one with a highly atomized social mode of indirect connection mediated by images. In the stage of it I call custom reality, we actually do the alienated labor of producing these images in the form of perception and interpretation under the direction of capital. The effect is an ideological worldview which passive-aggressively forces compliance with the way power is set up in society. The images are ultimately commodified, which, as with marketing, a representation of the human experience created for mainstream consumption would be reductive by necessity. Like, this linear video presentation that I have prepared doesn't represent everything about me. That does not represent me. Okay. It can't possibly ever fully represent me. I'm talking to you about a singular topic, which I intend to make a singular point about. And I'm not saying that is a good thing or a bad thing, just that it is true. I'm so much more. The viewer can't just ask this video of me a question. I mean, they could, but they wouldn't get an answer. It's an entirely linear representation of my thoughts on a single issue. This doesn't represent me, though. This doesn't represent me. That's no way. The spectacle is basically if everything was that. Separation perfected. Obviously, life tends to be a little more interactive than linear video, but even in person, our atomized relationships can have enough separation that this dynamic occurs to at least some extent. This impedes more direct communication, even in person. Things are expressed more passively, often sanitized as to not create conflict. This manages our image of both that person, of ourselves, and ultimately maintains the current version of our relationships with others and the world. This is, in many ways, an individualized version of the societal dynamic that maintains the ideological stereotypes of what people call marginalized groups. Let's say you don't know a black person, a trans person, a gay person, or whatever. The version you interact with is the one that the people who own the apparatus to distribute images distributes to you. Media representation, if we're taking a spectacular angle in our criticism, is part of an official culture, a canon, because mainstream media is entirely owned by a class of people who have no interest in disseminating genuinely revolutionary information. Representation, whether intentionally or not, creates a standard for reality, which creates expectations. In the past, films like 1915's Birth of a Nation worked to maintain the image amongst people who had never met a black person that black people are unintelligent and sexually aggressive, even violent towards white women. Now, films like Black Panther go out of their way to show good-hearted, inclusive, but not against the power structure black people working with the CIA to stop those evil black people. You know, revolutionaries. When black folks started revolutions, they never had the firepower or the resources to fight their oppressors. 
Where was Wakanda? This is what we can refer to as recuperation, which is the process by which images and ideas that are potentially damaging to the ruling order are twisted, co-opted, sanitized, incorporated, and or commodified by the media structure, which represents the interests of those who own it, and therefore ultimately the interests of the system itself. The film Black Panther is a market reaction to the position black people held in decades past and, as such, recuperates potentially revolutionary discontent that people have with the ruling order, co-opting, sanitizing, incorporating, and commodifying the true sentiment that racism is bad, ultimately assisting in deflecting the responsibility from the actual order of things where a class of people who own everything rules over everyone else and places that responsibility on individual people to get it and hashtag do better, as well as showing everyone that marginalized people can rule too. Hashtag BIPOC boss. Black Panther represents the liberal view of representation as a form of justice itself. Since liberalism is an ideology which preserves the current ruling order, representation as justice doesn't actually seek to abolish inequalities in the relationship between people and power. To address the issue of inequality, liberalism directs activists to seek proportional representation of various groups in and aligned with the ruling class. To quote Aimee Ho, writing about the 2018 film Crazy Rich Asians, In this moment of extreme wealth inequality and increasingly visible white supremacy, I'm not surprised that Warner Brothers took a bet on a movie where rich Asians show they can act like rich white people. The film contributes to the flattening of the Asian American experience, when in reality, economic division is at a historic high in the Asian American community. According to a recent report from Pew Research Center, the income gap between the richest and poorest Asian Americans is greater than any other racial group. Similarly, various ethnic groups may be pit against each other by comparing the image of a model minority, such as the perception that Asian Americans are naturally skilled at math or science, hardworking, affluent, agreeable, and enlightened, to the image of bad minorities, such as the image of the welfare queen or super predators. Uh, to quote Aimee Ho's article one more time, The logic goes, why can't all other minorities be like Asians? There can't be a model and good minority without there being a bad and lazy minority who, because of bad choices, deserves to be poor. The historical example is generally Asian people, but it's not necessary that this dynamic causes competition between different minority groups. Remember what I said about Black Panther? It contrasts good black people, the ones aligned with the United States, the CIA, and ultimately with capital, against the bad black people, the revolutionaries. A media-produced image commodity is meant to speak for and about any given person or group, and that is a perfect means to exert control in a capital-driven class society. They just direct people to demand positive representation rather than ownership and therefore control of the means and resources. This serves to assist in aligning what people consider good or positive with the current hegemonic power. In some cases of this, like with Black Panther, good even explicitly means ruling class and or aligned with the United States and CIA. My name is Everett. Yes, I know. Everett Ross, former Air Force pilot and now CIA. Right. I want to stress that being accepted into or by the ruling class is not abolishing the ruling class. Do all black people have a stake in black owned businesses? Just because that you're black, that does not mean that I'm gonna support you. I don't care if you're black. Matter of fact, I don't care if you're white, black, brown, purple, or yellow. If your business sucks, I'm not gonna support you. Do they all retain value from the operation of these businesses? And are Asians, who are often used as this image of a model minority, all rich? The answer to all of these questions is a very obvious no. The majority of black people, Asian people, and really just all people as a whole are working class, the proletariat. It's not even necessary to recuperate all of the discontent either. 
Ever notice that there's basically no push for schizophrenic representation or alcoholic representation? We intermittently see people decry bad representations of groups like this, but good representation is certainly not the main agenda. The structures really don't go out of their way to promote a positive image of any of those groups. Positive representation, boiled down, is about showing that a group can step up to deserve the American dream. The people who are in positions to uplift voices have been primed to think that people like schizophrenics, alcoholics, and the like can't possibly succeed at that. The structures just don't have a use for people with conditions that hinder productivity and require care and maintenance beyond what the average person needs. This doesn't represent a good investment to make with valuable time. Further, these stigmatized, often very small groups don't constitute a meaningful threat to the order. At its core, who deserves the American dream is kind of a garbage question to ask anyways, and the images class society has crafted as answers serve to mislead and condition the public. Consequently, Crazy Rich Asians was nominated for a ton of awards and won a fair amount of them. Black Panther had total marketing saturation and made $1.3 billion. These movies are aspirational. They're canon. They're official culture. They're good representation. The spectacle is the diplomatic representation of hierarchic society to itself, where all other expression is banned. Here, the most modern is also the most archaic. Modern society appears to be democratic. No kings, no lords, and no bedtimes. Fuck you, dad! Neoliberalism is just some nebulous word with no meaning. Capitalism isn't a good system, but <laughs> it's the only one that actually works. And the fact that a person is even allowed to say capitalism is bad on a massive media platform proves we've moved on from the worst, right? So on CNN, MSNBC, OAN, and Fox News, do we see alternatives presented? Uh, how about concrete paths to fundamental change away from capitalism and class society? Uh, what do we see instead of that? When the contradictions of class society continue to stack up, the ruling class has two options if they wish to preserve their power. Mandate we ignore them, or feed us bullshit. An ever-present example of the latter is the supposed anti-racism we often see in our media today. Now, when I say anti-racism, I am saying it as a proper noun. Capital A, capital R, anti-racism. Uh, when I talk about this term, I'm unfortunately not talking about engaging in the dismantling of racism or uniting people across racial lines. Uh, I'm referring to a popular ideology that ultimately essentializes people, assigns them fundamental traits, segregates them, and justifies it with ideas like intergenerational trauma. Except rather than some kind of epigenetic inheritance and expression of traits, uh, what a serious person might actually mean by the phrase, uh, people mean the actual plot of Assassin's Creed. What if I told you that the human body not only housed an individual's memory, but the memories of his ancestors as well? Genetic memory, if you will. So, who's feeding us this bullshit? It probably sounds simple, but in a capitalist society, it costs money to propagate information. So, it has to be the people who own everything, and therefore have the most capital, that are feeding us this bullshit. So, who has the most capital in the entire world? Well, the guy who owns the Washington Post. <laughs> that guy owns a lot of stuff. That's just one of many examples, but a very effective one. Owning the means to produce and distribute the cultural narrative is entirely what dictates the cultural narrative. So how do we beat this corporate nightmare? Well, if you believe liberals, it's storytelling and nonprofits. It's not ownership, though. It's just not taking a profit. You see, storytelling is social justice. Taken from this Facebook post with nearly no engagement, in order to achieve real social justice, we all need to be given a platform to share our stories 
can be heard. It's about changing the cultural narrative. TMI Project is a nonprofit organization offering transformative memoir workshops and performances that invite storytellers and audience members to explore new perspectives. By sharing bravely and candidly, storytellers become agents of change, fostering compassion, understanding, and public awareness. Being able to tell your story is a human right. And I believe that this business of telling our personal story is one of the truest forms of magic. Basically, it's an Annette factory. I need to tell my story properly. I need to tell my story properly. I need to tell my story properly. I tell you this because my story has value. My story has value. I will not allow my story to be destroyed. I just don't have the strength to take care of my story anymore. All I can ask is just please help me take care of my story. And that is the focus of the story. But the story really solved that problem. I'm very good at this job. TMI Project's actual legal name is Starling Productions Incorporated and was started in 2010. Starling's TMI Project project was funded by a Kickstarter to the tune of $20,233 in 2012, and Starling became a nonprofit in 2014. In 2019, Starling slash TMI Project received $750,000 in donations from Peter Buffett's Novo Foundation via a pass-through organization called Tides. This is not the entirety of the money they took in during the course of 2019, but it is the majority of it. Now, understanding just how much money comes in from the capitalist class, let's talk about a few hypothetical scenarios. First, let's talk about a story of a black small business owner who succeeded after years of perseverance and became an established institution. Somewhere along the line, someone with more money than this person invested in them and they used that capital in a clever way that ultimately worked out. This whole story you probably had several guesses as to who I was talking about because you've probably heard that story a million times. Well, it's not any one specific story. I made this story up. It's meant to be so generic that you think I'm talking about a story you know personally, and I'm not. This type of story supports the idea that hard work pays off. It paints the concept of investment as community and publicly inducts a member of a historically marginalized group into the bourgeoisie, the owning class. While I was telling it, you probably had several guesses as to who I was talking about, because you probably heard that story a million times and figured, that can't be hypothetical. I know who Peter's talking about. Now, it, it, it's really genuinely not anyone's specific story. I made that story up completely. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. This one was invented by a writer. I am a fiction author now. I, it, it, it's meant to be so generic that you think I'm talking about a story that you know personally. I am not. We hear a billion stories like this all the time in a billion motivational speaker presentations, a billion lectures, a billion TED Talks, a billion radio guests, and a billion, I guess what passes for stand-up comedy. Things. Jokes. Now, let's talk about a homeless former business owner who fractured their spine on the job, was prescribed opioids, became addicted, eventually transitioning to a heroin addiction, causing them to lose everything over the course of several years. Imagine they walked into the Novo-funded TMI project and said, Bitch! We need to tell my story so we can show the total failures of class society and tell people to build collective power totally unsupported by capital to avoid their influence with the goal of fundamentally changing the relationships to resources and the means of production. What do you think would happen next? Do you think there might be some hesitation to get this guy into the Nanette Industrial Complex? Like, when's his TED Talk? Yeah, uh, here's the thing. Our man is not even getting a TEDx, okay? You think we're going to hear him as a guest on Radio Kingston, which 
like TMI Project, is also located in Kingston, New York, and also primarily funded, actually owned by Novo and Peter Buffett. Yeah, I'll, I'll tune into Freedom Highway Sundays at 7 p.m. to find out. Sure, I'll check in on I Want What She Has at 1 p.m. next Monday for a nice heroin addict story about how owners are oppressors. Also, I'm checking out Harambi Radio on Friday at 1 p.m. just out of morbid curiosity. I don't even care if they mention fentanyl even once. In fact, the only way you ever hear stories like this is if they turn into a version of the other story where some angel investor takes a risk, intervenes, and it pays off big. This story doesn't go there. It ends with the guy realizing that the TMI project has a warm building and that there's furniture there and likely a bathroom. So he goes in to say, bitch, we need to tell my story. And that's the most recent part of the story. Also, I, I made this one up too. Like these are all hypotheticals making a point. What point you ask? That TMI could very easily, you know, tell him to get the fuck out. Seriously, they're under no obligation to platform this guy. That whole free speech doesn't mean the right to be heard or whatever people say to pretend tech companies don't have the power to censor because they're not the state. Free speech is anything but absolute. In fact, it only prevents the government from intruding on speech. You know what I'm talking about. Gonna need to call a special body of armed men and have this story escorted out the door though, right? Brutally enforce the contradictions of class, right? Yeah. Now, the thing is, that might cause some bad press if anyone finds out about it. And remember how I said the fact that a person is allowed to say capitalism is bad proves we've moved on from the worst? Remember that? I did say that. It's not true, though, because PMI could take a number of different routes as well. They could teach him to tell a version of his story that softens the rough edges, avoiding mention of anything that bumps up against class contradictions and power arrangements. They could introduce this individual to someone who invests time and money into people like him to turn him around and form the end of the first hypothetical story I mentioned so it can be told at a later date. They could even, without bias, help this guy work out his story and put him up on stage with like nine other stories that end with a positive note, reassuring everyone that if they just work hard then things will work out for them and allow the contrast to contextualize this guy as an anomaly. You know, nine out of ten stories we presented ended well. But you know who we're not gonna see? A TMI project showcase where every single storyteller discredits the ruling class and or calls for its abolition. You know why? Because that wouldn't uplift anyone. That's just tearing people down. According to Oxford Languages, social justice is justice in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. So the way I think storytelling turns out to be social justice lands on a spectrum between one of two things. One, it uses dire circumstances to prompt the capitalist class to use the power they have to individually quote-unquote uplift someone, thus creating good representation for a group. Or two, ideologically demonstrates how very, very possible it is for people to quote unquote make it despite those dire circumstances by showing off someone who has already done so. Ultimately, I, I don't care about the TMI project specifically. I'm sure that there are tens or even hundreds of other organizations like it. The thing I care about is that the organization centers around training people to perform their most traumatic stories to an audience for social justice. This could play out as a call for permission to live in better circumstances that one is a victim of, or a, a propagandistic display to remind people that even you can do it if you work hard. And it's generally available to folks who are or may become convenient to the Novo structure, a structure unaccountably driven by a single person who simply owns it. Recently, an in-depth investigation into Novo, its total dominance of Kingston, New York, and about how it ultimately reinforces the agenda at the man at the center of it was published in Tablet Magazine. A number of voices came out to defend Peter Buffett and Novo, where do you think those people learned rhetoric and affect from? 
How about narrative structure? And do you think the validating applause they got for their story at the TMI showcase or whatever related thing they did earned any loyalty from the guy who made it all possible, monetarily speaking? The investor who took a risk so that these chosen few could represent themselves? Again, it's not any one of these individual entities, whether Peter Buffett or Novo or the TMI project. It's the class of people who own. I've used these specific instances to demonstrate dynamics and try to show you what is possible so you can apply it elsewhere. I mean, you know the success story format? Uh, uh, when Boots Riley was promoting Sorry to Bother You, uh, interviewers on mainstream platforms were desperately trying to turn his class conscious film into a story where the filmmaker simply persevered. This script took a little while to get through oh, yeah. the gatekeepers and all that. Talk oh, about yeah. that process. I, I finished writing it in 2012. It, it's been six or seven years of we're going to start shooting in three months from now. Do you ever work, did you ever think about giving up? Uh, no. Yeah. So, you uh, call it an absurd <laughs> dark comedy, but there really is a very important message in that movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's an optimism. The, the people can do things like withhold their labor and and uh, and you know, uh, take hold of things, and there's an optimism that comes from that. Boots Riley didn't give up, and it's paying off. Yeah. Sorry to bother you, is in theaters now. Which, by the way, doesn't really contextualize the movie that well, does it? Like, check out this movie nobody wanted to make. He tried for years and eventually just made it himself. Sorry to bother you, in theaters now. It makes it sound like he didn't really create something that deserved the platform. Like he had to be, quote unquote, given one. Because the platform is a means to be heard which is owned by capital. The implication, intentional or not, was that this happens not because the movie was good, but because that's social justice. And you know, the statement, in order to achieve social justice, we must all be given a platform, is a tremendously revealing one. To be given anything, someone must first own it, and then make the decision that it's worth handing over to someone else. That is the problem with representation. I can't tell you if a story does or doesn't help people. I am not pretending that it can't. But representation awarded by the ruling class does nothing to confront the class contradictions of society, which is vital to change the everyday people's relationship to power. Historically marginalized groups don't exist because the normies hate them. They exist because the class of people in power have used them. Whether for free labor or as a scapegoat to avoid accountability, these groups have been utilized, exploited. The situations people are telling stories about are unavoidable in a structure built to concentrate ownership and therefore the ability to dictate rules among a select few people. That situation must go. Further, the fact that people must be given a platform must go. Platforms are simply sorting mechanisms where owners get to silently, passively dictate their terms through the mediation of other people's communication. The best case scenario for media representation is a game of telephone where information is faithfully passed along exclusively by the people who own the telephone system. Now, the weaknesses here should be fairly obvious, I think. Uh, a lot of the time, you see, we do not get the best case scenario. The owners are under no obligation to pass along any information that they don't want to and never have been and never will be. They own everything. In a class society like capitalism, media representation is a means for the dominant power to incorporate various images and aesthetics in a way that it maintains control and minimizes liabilities while appearing to facilitate progress, despite simply preserving the existing relationships between those who own and those who don't. This kind of fixation on representation is have-nots asking to be treated nicely by the people who will never give up what they have. 
Today, those people might happily smile down upon those below them while holding on to the ownership of everything. Tomorrow, they could choose not to. Concentrating on representation in the media does nothing to address this class divide. Further, its purported intent is to make society fair and equitable, specifically without addressing this class divide. When we agree this is the path forward, all we're doing is working to break a glass ceiling, only to quickly build a new floor where a few individuals can stand before everyone else can climb up. Having a few people from a historically marginalized group one floor higher than they were before for all to see isn't actually more fair and equitable at all. It's a show, entertainment even, a commodified image, and it's one that the people who own the airwaves, the satellites, and the fiber optic cables can just shut off anytime they want. So, do we want to forever ask the people who own and control everything to show us more nice images of people who are able to make it despite being marginalized? To show us that some black people can succeed in this bullshit, unfair, horrible situation that the other black people, the majority of black people, are obviously too lazy, dumb, or whatever to climb up the meritocratic ladder can't succeed in? How do we look at unsuccessful white people? Or should I say white trash? Is it okay if we start talking about the black people that make less than 40K a year the way we talk about white trash? Or do we want to acknowledge that this system inherently cannot and will not reproduce that image of that great situation as the material conditions for the vast majority of marginalized people or indeed all people and just... Stop buying what they're selling us. We have to break the class ceiling. I stepped on something. That's the end. Bye. Vincent van Gogh. The way we tell his story, it's no good. It was a very funny story. And the moral of our story is we don't give a shit. We don't give a fuck. <laughs>